the sermon in the sentence. Meeting with Nicodemus. Rabbi Jesus is the perfect example of a teacher. But we, and we are also teachers by word and example. John 3, verses 1 and 2. We look at Nicodemus. We look at Jesus. Now let's look at us in that context. Because I'm sorry. The bad news is you are a teacher whether you know it or not. Because there are people around you who are soaking you up like a sponge. Older children teach younger children. Spouses teach each other. Parents teach children. Hopefully employers teach employees. Your neighbors are paying attention to you. We all are teachers. Sometimes we teach by word. Sometimes we actually have to use our words. Now normally when we think about teachers, we think about a classroom environment. Whether it takes you back to a um, public school system, or whether it takes you to the university, or whether it takes you to Sunday school. And you think about a teacher presenting some kind of lesson and lecture to you, and you're sitting down there dreaming about escape. And that's probably our perfect cultural example of teaching with words. But it's also the most ineffective teaching with words. You know where real teaching with words comes from? Real teaching of words comes from hallway discussion. Two people sitting at a table drinking coffee together, teaching with words. Three guys poured in to this one guy's truck because he lifted the hood of it in the driveway. You lift the hood of a truck in a driveway and like men come from nowhere. And so, you know, so men are gathered around and they're looking in there and, uh, you know, they're judging you for the tools you are using. That's not the tool I would use. Um, They're offering their advice. They just want to be around the manliness. The words discussed around that open, it's a teaching moment. Have you ever gone hiking? I've, uh, I've really enjoyed the, the Adams, the Adams uh, Canyon Trail. I almost stopped early, not knowing that the 40-foot waterfall was like, you know, 90 seconds forward. But I, I, I got there, but I almost turned around. Walking on a trail in the wilderness with friends, family, and people. You have a lot of teaching with words while walking in nature. Really, you can't can't ever get away from teaching with words if you're hanging out with any other person. Because everything you say is a teaching opportunity. Everything you say is a teaching opportunity, my friends. And it makes an impact. Normally, teaching doesn't happen with facts. It's why I was always confused at memorizing the Ten Commandments or memorizing the books of the Bible or even memorizing the Lord's Prayer. Now, I did that. I was made to do it. I memorized those things. But memorizing those facts is not really teaching me divine truth. I'm simply memorizing the multiplication tables. I don't know the why behind it. So what is never answered. So when it comes to teaching by words, the secret is an old secret, my friends. You teach more by storytelling than you do by reciting facts. You teach more by storytelling than you do by teaching facts. I had a great stepfather as a teenager. My mother married when I was uh, um, uh, practically a teenager, and my stepfather was great. My stepfather liked to talk, though. And he had so many stories, and he repeated them a lot. In fact, my sister and I came up with a numbering system. 
because he repeated the same stories over and over and over again, and we were obnoxious teenagers, not like the teenagers here who are all delightful, I'm sure. But we assigned a number. It's like, uh uh-oh, he's about to start 37. And so sure enough, 37, the whole story goes through our heads. Run, 37 is starting up, you know. I don't remember a lot of facts, Dale said to me. But I know every single one of his 49 stories. And I know every detail from them. And it took a great deal of fatherly control not to say the 49 stories to my own children. But right now, I could list them all off. We'd be here for an hour and a half. Some of the best ways you can teach is by telling a story. That's why testimonies are so important. Tell the story of you coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Tell the story of you deciding to be baptized. Tell the story about God providing for you. Tell the story about you and Jesus. Tell it often. Tell it so much that your children assign a number to it. Because then when they're an old, old man, they're going to remember every detail of that story. Teach by words if you must. But words are weak when compared to actions, my friends. We teach more by what we do than what we say. They're, in fact, incomparable. We know that. That's why in our culture we have all these sarcastic, rude remarks about contradictions between word and actions. Don't do what I do, do what I say. So mom, while smoking, says don't smoke. And wonder why all her children grow up as smokers. Don't do what I do, but we all do what you do. We teach more by actions than by words. And that's why so many of us struggle with the next generation and their Christianity. But we brought our children to church and Sunday school every single week. We don't know why they're a 35-year-old pagan. I'm sorry, but I know why. Because going to church doesn't make you a Christian. And taking kids to Sunday school doesn't make them members of the faith. Especially not when you spend six days like a child of the devil and then go to church. What you're doing is you're giving them a vaccine against the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're immunizing them against the grace of God because you are teaching them by your actions that good people go to church to be seen but can then be bad for six days. And so they view it like a club of the H word. You knew I was going to say the H word. Hypocrites who say one thing and do another. So it's the gossip who complains about the people gossiping. Right? We know those. Our actions speak louder than our words. I have learned more from silent introverts than I have from any amount of preaching and teaching words shouted at me because of their example. You don't forget examples. And when you think you're not being observed, and so you're tempted to misbehave, that's when you're actually being watched the most. It's when you drop that bomb of curse words in the kitchen when you think no one is watching or listening, and then you turn around and find your five kids standing in the doorway. You can't undo that. They'll never, ever forget mom's sailor mouth. 
all because of dishes not being done in the kitchen. They'll remember that, and that will be the story they tell as part of your eulogy. Because I've been at that funeral. We teach by actions. So watch what you do. Because that's more important, almost, than what you say. And we teach under pressure. This is the one that gets me, my friends. My children learn never to wake me up from a nap to ask permission for anything. Because literally, if they woke me up from a nap and asked permission to breathe, my answer was, no, get away from me, ask your mother. And so they just, they didn't wake me up. And we can, we can pay self-control, a little self-monitoring to the words that we are teaching, to the way we are behaving. We can try to realize that eyes are on us when we think eyes aren't on us. But then when something goes wrong, we lose our stuff. When the pressure is on and everything has gone wrong and the world has come to an end for this moment at least, that's when we violate our faith and testimony. And in one moment, under pressure and weakness, we do something horrible. That is never forgotten. And the way to protect ourselves from teaching the wrong thing under pressure is to work toward it. Work on the way we teach with words. Work on the way that our actions and our lifestyles are teaching. Make sure we're teaching the right message. And the more we are exercising those muscles, when the pressure happens, our our muscle memory will kick in. And though the temptation will be to do the wrong thing, the reaction will be right under the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace and mercy of God. And so then in a moment of pressure, when everybody's eyes are saucers and they're remembering this, they'll take that lesson to heart and go, I know how to handle stress. Because I saw how to do it. And it was done with grace and understanding. Beauty. Power. We teach under pressure. And those are the great lessons. And we need to make sure that we are teaching Jesus and Jesus living. If we are Christians and our job, our entire purpose is to obey Christ. What are we teaching the people around us? Is anything more important than teaching Jesus and Jesus' lifestyle? If anything is more important than teaching Jesus and Jesus' lifestyle to you, I question your salvation. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to be shouting, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you've either gotten deaf to that, or you aren't even listening. We need to be teaching Jesus and Jesus' lifestyle in the way we speak and in the way we live. Sure, in a Sunday school classroom, but Tuesday morning at home as well. Thursday on the playground. Friday at the golf course. On vacation. At home in the kitchen. Jesus and Jesus living. And when we do that with our words and with our actions... Then we are on topic. And we are teaching gold. We are teaching divine truth with our lives. And isn't that the point? Isn't that the goal? Then we're on mission, my friends. And we can learn that from Nicodemus and Jesus in John chapter 3. Our application. What we should be talking about at lunch and this week. Have you come to Jesus? Like Nicodemus in the night. Come to him looking for forgiveness and salvation. Asking for a savior who will cleanse you from your sin, evil, and wickedness. And make it possible for you to have an intimate and vibrant relationship with a holy God. And receive the Holy Spirit. 
And then the hard one for us Christians. Are you living Jesus? Words, actions, under pressure. Are you teaching Jesus to your parents, to your spouse, to your children, to your neighbors, to your gym mates or your golf team or whatever? Are you teaching Jesus? Because that's the topic that matters, my friend. A lot to chew on. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you for uh, so much. We thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. We thank you, Father, for the example of Nicodemus. We thank you, Father, for all the teachings and wisdom of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to be living Jesus, 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 and teaching Jesus, Jesus.